Hi, my name's Jim. Um, I'm here to talk about art. And uh, we're going to start back at Lascaux. I know you're getting tired of these images, but this is the beginning. And I want to make a contrast here between these two, but I'm going to do it in a slightly different way this time. This is the bull, and these are the hands. And they're both extraordinary images. I'm not making a value judgment at all. So what we have here is we have information. Well, what kind of information? This is mark making about what we see. This is a reimagining of, of, of what we see. And then, so what's the difference? Well, with the hands, well, we also have information. But what kind of information? This isn't what we see. This is who we are. There's several differences here. You've got hard edge drawing. And here you've got a softness and a kind of a blurriness. And this type of mark making took off. This dominates Western art history. There's been a few times, however, where this swings back into focus and this becomes dominant. And that's what I want to talk about. And we're going to start with Impressionism. Uh, so here we are in France. And the, I think the pressure from the, the art establishment caused this swing. So you have the neoclassics, the pressure. You can't get an art show if you don't paint cherubs and naked ladies and stuff. And you had this extraordinary burst of creativity. It swung completely away back from the beast, back to the hands. And you've got Impression Sunrise by Manet. This is just a spectacular picture. It's just fantastic. It is such an unbound piece of work. It, it, was produced in this tyrannical environment of art marketing, and it just said no. It's an absolute rebellion. And the remarkable thing about it is its softness. It's just like the hands. And if you think back to Turner, it's kind of similar to that, except Turner has that hard edge tightness to it because he's Turner's trying to be He's trying to do, give us atmosphere, but in a hard-edged manner as a representation. Whereas Manet is just going completely into softness and, and blurriness. He's back to the hands. It has so much less to do about how we see and so much to do with who we are. Beautiful examples. I'm sorry this is so small. This, this painting is extraordinary. This is Manet. There's a little bit of hard edge, but it, the overall sky and sea is just softness. It's just, it's just wonderful. They're breaking down what we see. They're not painting what we see. They're painting who we are. And this is Manet again. And even though it does have some hard edge on it, these guys were right at the edge. So they are just wonderful. This brushwork, it's physical. It's not polished. The neoclassical stuff had to be mirror smooth. These guys are just out there. Whatever it was, French sensuality or whatever it was, rebellion, that, that Frenchness that led to this, it's absolutely one of the most beautiful art movements and extraordinarily important historically. And then we're going to look at what happened next. 
So after the, the initial burst of Impressionism and freedom and whatever, ethereal paint, uh, we have this movement and it's called modernism. And don't get me wrong, I love all of this work. I wouldn't ever show you anything I didn't like. But I just want to make some points here. This is Matisse early on. And this is Matisse later on. And I talk about the hard edge of the, the noun of, of representation. So here you have freedom. This is closer to the Impressionists. And he moves farther away from the Impressionists. Now, I do like this painting. I think this is going to outlast it because it's more painterly. But this is a trend. It's not just Matisse. This is modernism behind me. And I think they're going the wrong direction. They're going, they're going from the hands back to the bowl. And again, the mark of representation of, of information is hard edge. Cezanne and Van Gogh both were emerging out of the initial movement of Impressionism. And they're both, I'd, I'm not criticizing these paintings, but he's going backwards. At this point, they've reintroduced, Cezanne has reintroduced pretty much representation again. He's, he's, he never really left it, even his pictures of Mount Saint Victoria. The, he did the Cubist breakup and it's, he's going the wrong way. Instead of going into the hands, he's going back to the bowl. Same with Van Gogh, extraordinary painting. But again, I think the reason that these two artists are so popular is that they're right at that edge. They have kind of the impressionist freedom, but yet their safety and that they still have traditional information. It gets, it gets worse from there though. This is Paul Clay. This is actually one of his more loosey goosey pictures. This is Malevich. You can keep going, clear up to add Reinhardt. You can go into just this geom geometric type of thing. And here's Picasso. Now, personally, again, I love this picture. But let me contrast it to something. Let's contrast it to Manet's lilies. When you contrast it to this, this becomes merely clever. So to me, modernism was an entirely contained in its own box. It wasn't pushing ahead. And there's a reason why that's wrong. And it was taking place across the Atlantic in the United States. So what you have as your competition for sitting on your laurels and making silly work is you have a country that's developing its own voice. These were people that crossed the ocean and were faced with their own survival. Uh, the American Indians actually helped them through their first winter. They were starving to death. What emerged out of this incredible situation were hardened, surviving people that were honest because they, if they had to survive. And if they survived, that was their honesty. What is remarkable about the situation was how different and yet uniform all of the pictures we have are. All of the kids had big heads. They're all like these innocent bulbs of eyes and it's like a third too big. But all of the kids are like that. All of the farmhouses, all of the farms, they're just simple. You can interchange them. It's, it's a unified voice and it's the voice of surviving. So what you have first is you have survival. So you're, you've got your farmhouse and your barn and then you have a nice farm. So you're, you're thriving, you're starting to thrive. And here's Thomas Hart Benton. So 
This is how you thrive. Hard work, labor. You're, you're on your own. It's which end. But so you go from survival to thriving to technology. This is, this is Benton again. This is the horse racing the locomotive. Here's the locomotive. So you're going from surviving to thriving to technology. Here you have Hopper. And in all of these, you're not getting any sense of camaraderie. You're getting almost a sense of loneliness, of struggle, of hardness. You're not sensitive. You're not doing anything. This is Grant Wood. This is one of the most famous early American paintings. It's stern. It's not friendly. It's about surviving. The only, the only um, reference here that's interesting, and it's why he chose it, was this gothic window in this stupid American little farmhouse. This is his dentist. This is his sister. They're stern. They have elongated faces. It's about American survival. It's not frivolous. There's no frivolity. It's not clever. It's about hardness. This is David Smith. This is Hopper again, loneliness, Americans, the space between Americans, space. This is David Smith. This is really uh, one of my favorite, more contemporary sculptors. Again, you're not dealing with a neoclassic subject matter. This is just called the letter. It's literally a sculpture about a letter. This is just a letter. He doesn't say what it's about, but it's just, it doesn't matter what it's about. It's practical. This is America. This is, again, the loneliness theme. This is David Smith, and these are, this is called Friends. David Smith and Friends, and this is his work. This is, um, I forgot what this is called, but it's machine technology, back to the locomotive. This is American art, and it's hard and tough and honest. You've got Joseph Stella here. Again, it's the technology theme. Um, this is American art. It's not about royalty. It's not about poetry. It's about surviving and becoming strong. Now, the next thing I'd like to add is you see this up here in the corner. OK is an expression heard around the world. You can, you can hear it everywhere. What is it? So, OK is, a, is an Americanism. It was created in the American colonies. It's an abbreviation of British English. PDQ is American. This is not just, not just pioneers. This is how the pioneers changed English language. And, and I'm trying to back up what I'm saying here with art. If you go to London today and you go to a lumber store, you're going to be surrounded by used furniture. Well, in the colonies, there was no used furniture. There was hardly any furniture at all. And so used furniture got changed. In the word used furniture, lumber, was changed into what made it. Again, it's about surviving and about creating. So. Lumber became about making it. And it's the same with stone. In Britain, the word stone has to do with body weight, weight. Well, in the colonies, no one cared how much they weighed. There probably weren't any fat people. So stone became the heavy thing that in the middle of your field that you had to move so you could plow it. That's American English. It's about surviving. Let me read you just a couple more. OK is fabulous. OK, it became international. Lickety split. That's an American term. Let the fur fly. Pull the wool over your eyes. These are all Americanisms. The British don't talk this way. This is all about survival. This is how we changed English. Know the ropes. Run it into the ground. And this is 
Two more, this is one of my favorites, to pan out, meaning to work out, to be successful, to pan out. It comes from gold mining and getting that gold dust to pan out. That's how we changed British English. One more, to go for it. That's an Americanism. British people just don't even talk that way. To go for it. Let's go for it. That's America. And this is American art. Another thing about American art that makes it unique is America itself. The American West is just absolutely extraordinary place and it has had a tremendous effect on American art. And I mean, here you have Clifford Still, you could, this is almost representational of, of both of these landscapes, Mesa National Monument and the Grand Canyon. It's, a, it's almost representational. You've got Rothko here. I mean, look at, look at this. I mean, it just, it's the sense of space and the sense of distance. It goes back to Hopper and that, that loneliness and the individuality. Look at that, he even put the sun in there. See that? Where is all this leading? This, is, this country started with big-headed kids and it, it ended up right back to the hands. You've got Pollock and de Kooning. You couldn't, you couldn't have less what you see representation than these two men. You've got You've got a little bit of relational brush strokes in the de Kooning, which is why I do prefer the Pollock. The both men are way out there. They're completely away from the bull and they're back at the hands. But let's see what happens next. So I know um, half of you are mad at me for, for talking about modernism the way I did and saying that Picasso was merely clever. Um, I want to show you what happened in the US. So you've got Pollock. So what happens is you get the same, same development of the modernist techniques. You've got, you've got Rauschenberg here and, and you're reintroducing representation, you're reintroducing structure. It's like back to Matisse where he had the loosey goosey thing and then he becomes, with the cutouts, he becomes rigid. And it's, it's, they're going backwards. Here's, here's Jasper Johns with his maps. He's got the grid there. He's, he's going from the hands back to the bull. It's the same what happened with modernism. You're going the wrong way. It's go into freedom. Go, go into the, the ethereal. Go into outer space. This is Stella. It's the same thing except that I can forgive Stella a bit because what this is a print but this is structure so he's trying to go into real space so half of the structure the, that we see here is tr he's trying to get paint into real space so I've described him as a structuralist before um, I want to show you four of my pieces and how I've solved the structure. So what you're seeing is a repeat of the negative modernistic tendencies after the freedom. This is my version of the hands. Um, this work is completely abstract and I use the space just to focus the extreme texture. So you've got, basically, this is influenced by Malevich. It's kind of represent, uh, relational, except that the texture of the brush strokes are so intense that you don't see it in that context. This one is an ode to Stella, just, I guess, because of the aluminum, and I understand what he's trying to do. And I think this is much more elegant. This is kind of my take on Jasper John's flags. It's subdued color, but again, the texture, I'm, I'm working on this. I'm gonna, my next piece is gonna have more individualistic color on each shape, but still much handling. This one is my favorite. 
it's just visceral. There's no, it's not trying to do anything. It's not trying to say anything. It's just, it's a, uh, it's just me. This is me. Thank you. Um, just as a brief in, insert, this is uh, this is my version of David Smith's letter. He uh, his piece was just kind of a you know a square with words. Um, this this is my version. It's a bit of an update. It's colorful, but this is love letter. This is called love letter. So it's you know holding and colorful and. I am influenced by David Smith also. I'm influenced by everybody. But this is love letter in relation to David Smith's letter. <laughs>